Section 8 of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Pathetic Imposture Lord Rosebery once annoyed the press by declaring that his ideal newspaper was one which should give its news without comment. Doubtless he was thinking of the common will, yet a plea for no comments might be made with equal force in behalf of the commentators themselves. Occupations that are injurious to the persons engaged in them ought not to be encouraged. The writing of leaders and notes is one of these occupations. The practice of it, more than of any other, depends on and fosters hypocrisy, worst of vices. In a sense, every kind of writing is hypocritical. It has to be done with an air of gusto, though no one ever yet enjoyed the act of writing. Even a man with a specific gift for writing, with much to express, with perfect freedom in choice of subject and manner of expression, with indefinite leisure, does not write with real gusto. But in him the pretense is justified. He has enjoyed thinking out his subject. He will delight in his work when it is done. Very different is the pretense of one who writes at top speed on a set subject what he thinks the editor thinks the proprietor thinks the public thinks nice. If he happen to have a talent for writing, his work will be but the more painful, and his hypocrisy the greater. The chances are, though, that the talent has already been sucked out of him by journalism, that vampire. To her, too, he will have forfeited any fervor he may have had, any learning, any gaiety. How can he, the jaded interpreter, hold any opinion, feel any enthusiasm? Without leisure, keep his mind in cultivation be sprightly to order, at unearthly hours, in a whirring office, to order. Yes, sprightliness is compulsory there. So are weightiness and fervor and erudition. He must seem to abound in these advantages, or another man will take his place. He must disguise himself at all costs but disguises are not easy to make they require time and care which he cannot afford so he must snatch up ready-made disguises unhook them rather he must know all the cant phrases the cant references there are very very many of them and belike it is hard to keep them all at one's finger-tips but at least there is no difficulty in collecting them plod through the leaders and notes in a half dozen of the daily papers and you will bag whole coveys of them most of the morning papers still devote much space to the old-fashioned kind of leader in which the pretense is of weightiness rather than of fervor sprightliness or erudition the effect of weightiness is obtained simply by a stupendous disproportion of language to sense. The longest and most emphatic words are used for the simplest and most trivial statements, and they are always so elaborately qualified as to leave the reader with a vague impression that a very difficult matter, which he himself cannot make head or tail of, has been dealt with in a very judicial and exemplary manner. A leader writer would not, for instance, say, Lord Rosebery has made a paradox. He would say, Lord Rosebery, whether intentionally or otherwise we leave our readers to decide, or, with seeming conviction, or, doubtless giving rein to the playful humour which is characteristic of him, has expressed a sentiment, or 
taken on himself to enunciate a theory, or made himself responsible for a dictum, which we venture to assert, or we have little hesitation in declaring, or we may be pardoned for thinking, or we may say without fear of contradiction, is nearly akin to, or not very far removed from, the paradoxical. But I will not examine further the trick of weightiness. It takes up too much of my space. Besides, these long leaders are a mere survival, and will soon disappear altogether. The notes are the characteristic feature of the modern newspaper, and it is in them that the modern journalist displays his fervor, sprightliness, and erudition. Note-writing, like chess, has certain recognized openings, e.g., there is no new thing under the sun. It is always the unexpected that happens. Nature, as we know, abhors a vacuum. The late Lord Coleridge once electrified his court by inquiring who is Connie Gilchrist. And here are some favorite methods of conclusion. A mad world, my masters. Tis true, tis pity, and pity, tis, tis true. There is much virtue in that if. But that, as Mr. Kipling would say, is another story. Si non è vero, etc. Or, lighter style, we fancy we recognize here the hand of Mr. Benjamin Trovato. Not less inevitable are such parallelisms as Like Topsy, perhaps it growed. Like the late Lord Beaconsfield on a famous occasion on the side of the angels. Like Br'er Rabbit to lie low and say nothing. Like Oliver Twist to ask for more. Like Sam Weller's knowledge of London, extensive and peculiar. Like Napoleon, a believer in the big battalions. Nor let us forget Pyrrhic victory, Parthian dart, and Homeric laughter, Quos Deus Vult, and Nil de Mortuis, Sturm und Drang, Masterly inactivity, Unctuous rectitude, Mute inglorious Miltons, and damned good-natured friends, the sword of Damocles, the thin edge of the wedge, the long arm of coincidence, and the soul of goodness in things evil, Hobson's choice, Frankenstein's monster, Macaulay's schoolboy, Lord Burleigh's nod, Sir Boyle Roach's bird, Mohammed's coffin, and Davy Jones's Locker. A melancholy catalogue, is it not? But it is less melancholy for you who read it here than for them whose existence depends on it, who draw from it a desperate means of seeming to accomplish what is impossible. And yet these are the men who shrank in horror from Lord Rosebery's merciful idea. They ought to be saved despite themselves. Might not a short act of Parliament be passed, making all comments in daily newspapers illegal? In a way, of course, it would be hard on the commentators, having lost the power of independent thought, having sunk into a state of chronic dullness, apathy, and insincerity, they could hardly be expected to succeed in any of the ordinary ways of life. They could not compete with their fellow creatures. No door but would be bolted if they knocked on it. What would become of them? Probably they would have to perish in what they would call what the late Lord Goshen would have called splendid isolation. But 
such an end were sweeter, I suggest to them, than the life they are leading. End of section 8 Section 9 of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Decline of the Graces Have you read the young lady's book? You have had plenty of time to do so, for it was published in 1829. It was described by the two anonymous gentlewomen who compiled it as a manual for elegant recreations exercises and pursuits you wonder they had nothing better to think of you suspect them of having been triflers they were not believe me they were careful to explain at the outset that the virtues of character were what a young lady should most assiduously cultivate they in their day laboring under the shadow of the eighteenth century had somehow in themselves that high moral fervor which marks the opening of the twentieth century and is said to have come in with mr george bernard shaw but unlike us they were not concerned wholly with the inward and spiritual side of life they cared for the material surface too they were learned in the frills and furbelows of things they gave indeed a whole chapter to embroidery another they gave to archery another to the aviary another to the escrutoire young ladies do not now keep birds nor shoot with bow and arrow but they do still in some measure write letters and so for sake of historical comparison let me give you a glance at the escritoire it is not light reading for careless scrawls ye boast of no pretence fair russell wrote as well as spoke with sense thus is the chapter headed with a delightful little wood engraving of fair russell looking preeminently sensible at her desk to prepare the reader for the imminent welter of rules for decorous composition. Not that pedantry is approved. Ease and simplicity, an even flow of unlabored diction, an artless arrangement of obvious sentiments, is the ideal to be striven for. A metaphor may be used with advantage by any young lady, but only if it occur naturally, and allusions are elegant, but only when introduced with ease, and when they are well understood by those to whom they are addressed. An antithesis renders a passage piquant, but the dire results of a too frequent indulgence in it are relentlessly set forth pages and pages are devoted to a minute survey of the pitfalls of punctuation but when the young lady of that period had skirted all these and had observed all the manifold rules of calligraphy that were here laid down for her she was not even then out of the wood very special stress was laid on the use of the seal bitter scorn was poured on young ladies who misused the seal it is a habit of some to thrust the wax into the flame of the candle and the moment a morsel of it is melted to daub it on the paper and when an unsightly mass is gathered together to pass the seal over the tongue with ridiculous haste press it with all the strength which the sealing party possesses, and the result is an impression which raises a blush on her cheek. Well, the young ladies of that day were ever expected to exhibit sensibility, and used to blush just as they wept or fainted for very slight causes. 
their tears and their swoons did not necessarily betoken much grief or agitation nor did a rush of colour to the cheek mean necessarily that they were overwhelmed with shame to exhibit various emotions in the drawing-room was one of the elegant exercises in which these young ladies were drilled thoroughly and their habit of simulation was so rooted in sense of duty that it merged into sincerity if a young lady did not swoon at the breakfast-table when her papa read aloud from the times that the duke of wellington was suffering from a slight chill the chances were that she would swoon quite unaffectedly when she realized her omission even so we may be sure that a young lady whose cheek burned not at sight of the letter she had sealed untidily unworthily the manual calls it would anon be blushing for her shamelessness such a thing as the blurring of the family crest or as the pollution of the profile of pallas athene with the smoke of the taper was hardly indeed one of those very slight causes to which i have referred the georgian young lady was imbued through and through with the sense that it was her duty to be gracefully efficient in whatsoever she set her hand to to the young lady of to-day belike she will seem accordingly ridiculous seem poor-spirited and a pettifogger true she set her hand to no grandiose tasks she was not allowed to become a hospital nurse for example or an actress the young lady of to-day when she hears in herself a vocation for tending the sick would willingly without an instant's preparation assume responsibility for the lives of a whole ward at st thomas's this responsibility is not however thrust on her she has to submit to a long and tedious course of training before she may do so much as smooth a pillow the boards of the theatre are less jealously hedged in than those of the hospital if our young lady have a wealthy father and retain her schoolroom faculty for learning poetry by heart there is no power on earth to prevent her from making her debut somewhere as juliet if she be so inclined and such is usually her inclination that her voice is untrained that she cannot scan blank verse that she cannot gesticulate with grace and propriety nor move with propriety and grace across the stage matters not a little bit to our young lady feeling she will say is everything and of course she at the age of eighteen has more feeling than juliet that flapper could have had all those other things those little technical tricks can be picked up or will come but no i misrepresent our young lady if she be conscious that there are such tricks to be played she despises them when later she finds the need to learn them she still despises them it seems to her ridiculous that one should not speak and comport oneself as artlessly on the stage as one does off it the notion of speaking or comporting oneself with conscious art in real life would seem to her quite monstrous it would puzzle her as much as her grandmother would have been puzzled by the contrary notion personally i range myself on the grandmother's side i take my stand shoulder to shoulder with the graces on the banner that i wave is embroidered a device of prunes and prisms i am no blind fanatic however i admit that artlessness is a charming idea i admit that it is sometimes charming as a reality i applaud it all the more heartily because it is rare in children but then children like the young of all animals whatsoever have a natural grace as a rule they begin to show it in their third year 
and to lose it in their ninth. Within that span of six years, they can be charming without intention, and their so frequent failure in charm is due to their voluntary or enforced imitation of the ways of their elders. In Georgian and early Victorian days, the imitation was always enforced. Grown-up people had good manners, and wished to see them reflected in the young. Nowadays, the imitation is always voluntary. Grown-up people have no manners at all, whereas they certainly have a very keen taste for the intrinsic charm of children. They wish children to be perfectly natural. That is, aesthetically at least, an admirable wish. My complaint against these grown-up people is that they themselves, whom time has robbed of their natural grace as surely as it robs the other animals, are content to be perfectly natural. This contentment I deplore, and am keen to disturb. I accept from my indictment any young lady who may read these words. I will assume that she differs from the rest of the human race, and has not, never had, anything to learn in the art of conversing prettily, of entering or leaving a room or a vehicle gracefully, of writing appropriate letters, et patati et patata. I will assume that all these accomplishments came naturally to her, she will now be in a mood to accept my proposition that of her contemporaries none seems to have been so lucky as herself. She will agree with me that other girls need training. She will not deny that grace in the little affairs of life is a thing which has to be learned. Some girls have a far greater aptitude for learning it than others, but with one exception no girls have it in them from the outset it is a not less complicated thing than is the art of acting or of nursing the sick and needs for the acquirement of it a not less laborious preparation is it worth the trouble certainly the trouble is not taken the finishing school wherein young ladies were taught to be graceful is a thing of the past it must have been a dismal place but the dismalness of it the strain of it was the measure of its indispensability there i beg the question is grace itself indispensable certainly it has been dispensed with it isn't reckoned with to sit perfectly mute in company or to chatter on at the top of one's voice, to shriek with laughter, to fling oneself into a room and dash oneself out of it, to collapse on chairs or sofas, to sprawl across tables, to slam doors, to write without punctuation notes that only an expert in handwriting could read, and only an expert in misspelling could understand, to hustle, to bounce, to go straight ahead, to be, let us say, perfectly natural in the midst of an artificial civilization, is an ideal which the young ladies of today are neither publicly nor privately discouraged from cherishing. The word cherishing implies a softness of which they are not guilty. I hasten to substitute pursuing. If these young ladies were not in the aforesaid midst of an artificial civilization, I should be the last to discourage their pursuit. If they were Amazons, for example, spending their lives beneath the sky, in tilth of stubborn fields, and in armed conflict with fierce men, it would be unreasonable to expect of them any sacrifice to the graces. But they are exposed to no such hardships, they have a really very comfortable sort of life they are not expected to be useful i am writing all the time of course about the young ladies in the affluent classes 
and it seems to me that they in payment of their debt to fate ought to occupy the time that is on their hands by becoming ornamental and increasing the world's store of beauty in a sense certainly they are ornamental it is a strange fact and an ironic that they spend quite five times the annual amount that was spent by their grandmothers on personal adornment if they can afford it well and good let us have no sumptuary law but plenty of pretty dresses will not suffice pretty manners are needed with them and are prettier than they i had forgotten men every defect that i had noted in the modern young woman is not less notable in the modern young man briefly he is a boor if it is true that manners maketh man one doubts whether the british race can be perpetuated the young englishman of to-day is inferior to savages and to beasts of the field in that they are eager to show themselves in an agreeable and seductive light to the females of their kind whilst he regards any such effort as beneath his dignity not that he cultivates dignity in demeanour he merely slouches unlike his feminine counterpart he lets his raiment match his manners observe him any afternoon as he passes down piccadilly sullenly with his shoulders humped and his hat clapped to the back of his head and his cigarette dangling almost vertically from his lips it seems only appropriate that his hat is a billycock and his shirt a flannel one and that his boots are brown ones thus attired he is on his way to pay a visit of ceremony to some house at which he has recently dined no that is the sort of visit he never pays i must confess i don't myself but one remembers the time when no self-respecting youth would have shown himself in piccadilly without the vesture appropriate to that august highway nowadays there is no care for appearances comfort is the one aim any care for appearances is regarded rather as a sign of effeminacy yet never in any other age of the world's history has it been regarded so indeed elaborate dressing used to be deemed by philosophers an outcome of the sex instinct it was supposed that men dressed themselves finely in order to attract the admiration of women just as peacocks spread their plumage with a similar purpose nor do i jettison the old theory the declension of masculine attire in england began soon after the time when statistics were beginning to show the great numerical preponderance of women over men and is it fanciful to trace the one fact to the other surely not i do not say that either sex is attracted to the other by elaborate attire but i believe that each sex consciously or unconsciously uses this elaboration for this very purpose thus the overdressed girl of to-day and the ill-dressed youth are but symbols of the balance of our population the one is pleading the other scorning take me is the message borne by the furs and the pearls and the old lace i'll see about that when i've had a look round is the not pretty answer conveyed by the billycock and the flannel shirt i dare say that fine manners like fine clothes are one of the stratagems of sex this theory squares at once with the modern young man's lack of manners but how about the modern young woman's not less obvious lack well the theory will square with that too the modern young woman's gracelessness may be due to her conviction that men like a girl to be thoroughly natural she knows that they have a very high opinion of themselves and what thinks she 
more natural than that they should esteem her in proportion to her power of reproducing the qualities that are most salient in themselves men she perceives are clumsy and talk loud and have no drawing-room accomplishments and are rude and she proceeds to model herself on them let us not blame her let us blame rather her parents or guardians who though they well know that a masculine girl attracts no man leave her to the devices of her own inexperience girls ought not to be allowed as they are to run wild so soon as they have lost the natural grace of childhood they should be initiated into that course of artificial training through which their grandmothers passed before them and in virtue of which their grandmothers were pleasing this will not of course ensure husbands for them all but it will certainly tend to increase the number of marriages nor is it primarily for that sociological reason that i plead for a return of the old system of education i plead for it first and last on aesthetic grounds let the graces be cultivated for their own sweet sake the difficulty is how to begin the mothers of the rising generation were brought up in the unregenerate way their scraps of oral tradition will need to be supplemented by much research i advise them to start their quest by reading the young lady's book exactly the right spirit is therein enshrined though of the substance there is much that could not well be applied to our own day the chapter on the escrutoire for example belongs to a day that cannot be recalled we can get rid of bad manners but we cannot substitute the sedan chair for the motor car and the penny post with telephones and telegrams has in our own beautiful phrase come to stay and has elbowed the art of letter-writing irrevocably from among us but notes are still written and there is no reason why they should not be written well has the mantle of those anonymous gentlewomen who wrote the young lady's book fallen on no one will no one revise that manual of elegant recreations exercises and pursuits adapting it to present needs a few hints as to the deportment in the motor-car the exact angle whereat to hold the receiver of a telephone and the exact key wherein to pitch the voice the conduct of a cigarette i see a wide and golden vista End of section 9Section 10 of Yet Again by Max Bierbaum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Whistler's Writing. No book lover, I, give me an uninterrupted view of my fellow creatures. The most tedious of them pleases me better than the best book. You see, I admit that some of them are tedious i do not deem alien from myself nothing that is human i discriminate my fellow-creatures according to their contents and in that respect i am not more different in my way from the true humanitarian than from the true bibliophile in his to him the content of a book matters not at all he loves books because they are books and discriminates them only by the irrelevant standard of their rarity a rare book is not less dear to him because it is unreadable even as to the snob a dull duke is as good as a bright one indeed why should he bother about readableness he doesn't want to read uncut edges for him when he can get them and even when he can't the notion of reading a rare edition would seem to him quite uncouth and preposterous 
the aforesaid snob would as soon question his grace about the state of his grace's soul i on the other hand whenever human company is denied me have often a desire to read reading i prefer to cut edges because a paper-knife is one of the things that have the gift of invisibility whenever they are wanted and because one's thumb in prizing open the pages so often affects the text many volumes have i thus mutilated and i hope that in the sale-rooms of a sentimental posterity they may fetch higher prices than their duly uncut duplicates so long as my thumb tatters merely the margin i am quite equanimous if i were reading a first folio shakespeare by my fireside and if the match-box were ever so little beyond my reach i vow i would light my cigarette with a spill made from the margin of whatever page i were reading i am neat scrupulously neat in regard to the things i care about but a book as a book is not one of these things of course a book may happen to be in itself a beautiful object such a book i treat tenderly as one would a flower and such a book is in its brown papered boards whereon gleam little gilt italics and a little gilt butterfly whistler's gentle art of making enemies it happens to be also a book which i have read again and again a book that has often travelled with me yet its cover is as fresh as when first some twelve years since it came into my possession a flower freshly plucked one would say a brown and yellow flower with a little gilt butterfly fluttering over it and its inner petals its delicately proportioned pages are as white and undishevelled as though they never had been opened the book lies open before me as i write i must be careful of my pen's transit from ink-pot to manuscript yet i know many worthy folk would like the book blotted out of existence these are they who understand and love the art of painting but neither love nor understand writing as an art for them the gentle art of making enemies is but something unworthy of a great man certainly it is a thing incongruous with a great hero and for most people it is painful not to regard a great man as also a great hero hence all the efforts to explain away the moral characteristics deducible from the gentle art of making enemies and to prove that whistler beneath a prickly surface was saturated through and through with the quintessence of the sermon on the mount well hero worship is a very good thing it is a wholesome exercise which we ought all to take now and again only let us not strain ourselves by overdoing it let us not indulge in it too constantly let hero-worship be reserved for heroes and there was nothing heroic about whistler except his unfaltering devotion to his own ideals in art no saint was he and none would have been more annoyed than he by canonization would he were here to play as he would have played incomparably the devil's advocate so far as he possessed the christian virtues his faith was in himself his hope was for the immortality of his own works and his charity was for the defects in those works he is known to have been an affectionate son an affectionate husband but for the rest all the tenderness in him seems to have been absorbed into his love for such things in nature as were expressible through terms of his own art as a man in relation to his fellow-men he cannot from any purely christian standpoint be applauded he was inordinately vain and cantankerous 
enemies as he has wittily implied were a necessity to his nature and he seems to have valued friendship a thing never really valuable in itself to a really vain man as just the needful foundation for future enmity quarrelling and picking quarrels he went his way through life blithely most of those quarrels were quite trivial and tedious in the ordinary way they would have been forgotten long ago as the trivial and tedious details in the lives of other great men are forgotten but whistler was great not merely in painting not merely as a wit and dandy in social life he had also an extraordinary talent for writing he was a born writer he wrote in his way perfectly and his way was his own and the secret of it has died with him thus conducting them through the post office he has conducted his squabbles to immortality immortality is a big word i do not mean by it that so long as this globe shall endure the majority of the crawlers round it will spend the greater part of their time in reading the gentle art of making enemies even the pre-eminently immortal works of shakespeare are read very little the average of time devoted to them by englishmen cannot even though one assumes mr frank harris at eight hours per diem and mr sidney lee at twenty-four tot up to more than a small fraction of a second in a lifetime reckoned by the psalmist's limit when i dub whistler an immortal writer i do but mean that so long as there are a few people interested in the subtler ramifications of english prose as an art form so long will there be a few constantly recurring readers of the gentle art there are in england at this moment a few people to whom prose appeals as an art but none of them i think has yet done justice to whistler's prose none has taken it with the seriousness it deserves i am not surprised when a man can express himself through two media people tend to take him lightly in his use of the medium to which he devotes the lesser time and energy even though he use that medium not less admirably than the other and even though they themselves care about it more than they care about the other perhaps this very preference in them creates a prejudice against the man who does not share it and so makes them sceptical of his power anyhow if disraeli had been unable to express himself through the medium of political life disraeli's novels would long ago have had the due which the expert is just beginning to give them had rossetti not been primarily a poet the expert in painting would have acquired long ago his present penetration into the peculiar value of rossetti's painting likewise if whistler had never painted a picture and even so had written no more than he actually did write this essay in appreciation would have been forestalled again and again as it is i am a sort of herald and however loudly i shall blow my trumpet not many people will believe my message for many years to come it will be the fashion among literary critics to pooh-pooh whistler the writer as an amateur for whistler was primarily a painter not less than was rossetti primarily a poet and disraeli a statesman and he will not live down quicklier than they the taunt of amateurishness in his secondary art nevertheless i will for my own pleasure blow the trumpet i grant you whistler was an amateur but you do not dispose of a man by proving him to be an amateur on the contrary an amateur with real innate talent may do must do more exquisite work than he could do if he were a professional his very ignorance and tentativeness may be must be 
a means of especial grace not knowing how to do things having no ready-made and ready working apparatus and being in constant fear of failure he has to grope always in the recesses of his own soul for the best way to express his soul's meaning he has to shift for himself and to do his very best consequently his work has a more personal and fresher quality and a more exquisite finish than that of a professional howsoever finely endowed all of the much that we admire in walter pater's prose comes of the lucky chance that he was an amateur and never knew his business had fate thrown him out of oxford upon the world the world would have been the richer for the prose of another john addington simmons and would have forfeited walter pater's prose in other words we should have lost a half-crown and found a shilling had fate withdrawn from whistler his vision for form and colour leaving him only his taste for words and phrases and cadences whistler would have settled solidly down to the art of writing and would have mastered it and mastering it have lost that especial quality which the muse grants only to them who approach her timidly bashfully as suitors perhaps i am wrong perhaps whistler would never in any case have acquired the professional touch in writing for we know that he never acquired it in the art to which he dedicated all but the surplus of his energy compare him with the other painters of his day he was a child in comparison with them they with sure science solved roughly and readily problems of modelling and drawing and what not that he never dared to meddle with it has often been said that his art was an art of evasion but the reason of the evasion was reverence he kept himself reverently at a distance he knew how much he could not do nor was he ever confident even of the things that he could do and these things therefore he did superlatively well having to grope for the means in the recesses of his soul the particular quality of exquisiteness and freshness that gives to all his work whether on canvas or on stone or on copper a distinction from and above any contemporary work and makes it dearer to our eyes and hearts is a quality that came to him because he was an amateur and that abided with him because he never ceased to be an amateur he was a master through his lack of mastery in the art of writing too he was a master through his lack of mastery there is an almost exact parallel between the two sides of his genius nothing could be more absurd than the general view of him as a masterly professional on the one side and a trifling amateur on the other he was certainly a painter who wrote but by the slightest movement of fate's little finger he might have been a writer who painted and this essay have been written not by me from my standpoint but by some painter eager to suggest that whistler's painting was a quite serious thing yes that painting and that writing are marvellously akin and such differences as you will see in them are superficial merely i spoke of whistler's vanity in life and i spoke of his timidity and reverence in art that contradiction is itself merely superficial bob acres was timid but he was also vain his swagger was not an empty assumption to cloak his fears he really did regard himself as a masterful and daredevil fellow except when he was actually fighting similarly except when he was set at his work whistler doubtless really did think of himself as a brilliant effortless butterfly the pose was doubtless a quite sincere one a necessary reaction of feeling well in his writing he displays to us his vanity 
whilst in his painting we discern only his reverence. In his writing, too, he displays his harshness, swoops hither and thither a butterfly equipped with the sharp little beak and talons, whereas in his painting we are conscious only of his caressing sense of beauty. But look from the writer, as shown by himself, to the means by which himself is shown. You will find that for words, as for color tones, he has the same reverent care, and for phrases, as for forms, the same caressing sense of beauty. Fastidiousness, daintiness, as he would have said, dandyishness, as we might well say, by just that which marks him as a painter is he marked as a writer too his meaning was ever ferocious but his method how delicate and tender the portrait of his mother whom he loved was not wrought with a more loving hand than were his portraits of mr harry quilter for the world his style never falters the silhouette of no sentence is ever blurred every sentence is ringing with a clear vocal cadence there after all in that vocal quality is the chief test of good writing writing as a means of expression has to compete with talking the talker need not rely wholly on what he says he has the help of his mobile face and hands and of his voice with its various inflections and its variable pace whereby he may insinuate fine shades of meaning qualifying or strengthening at will and clothing naked words with colour and making dead words live but the writer he can express a certain amount through his handwriting if he write in a properly elastic way but his writing is not printed in facsimile it is printed in cold mechanical monotonous type for his every effect he must rely wholly on the words that he chooses and on the order in which he ranges them and on his choice among the few hard and fast symbols of punctuation he must so use those slender means that they shall express all that he himself can express through his voice and face and hands or all that he would thus express if he were a good talker usually the good talker is a dead failure when he tries to express himself in writing for that matter so is the bad talker but the bad talker has the better chance of success inasmuch as the inexpressiveness of his voice and face and hands will have sharpened his scent for words and phrases that shall in themselves convey such meanings as he has to express whistler was that rare phenomenon the good talker who could write as well as he talked read any page of the gentle art of making enemies and you will hear a voice in it and see a face in it and see gestures in it and none of these is quite like any other known to you it matters not that you never knew whistler never even set eyes on him you see him and know him here the voice drawls slowly quickening to a kind of snap at the end of every sentence and sometimes rising to a sudden screech of laughter and all the while the fine fierce eyes of the talker are flashing out at you and his long nervous fingers are tracing extravagant arabesques in the air no you need never have seen whistler to know what he was like he projected through printed words the clean-cut image and clear rigging echo of himself he was a born writer achieving perfection through pains which must have been infinite for that we see at first sight no trace of them at all like himself necessarily his style was cosmopolitan and eccentric it comprised americanisms and cockneyisms and parisian argot with constant reminiscences of the authorized version of the old testament and with chips off moliere 
and with shreds and tags of what not snatched from a hundred and one queer corners it was in fact an autolycine style it was a style of the maddest motley but of motley so deftly cut and fitted to the figure and worn with such an air as to become a gracious harmony for all beholders after all what matters is not so much the vocabulary as the manner in which the vocabulary is used whistler never failed to find right words and the right cadence for a dignified meaning when dignity was his aim Quote, and when the evening mist clothes the riverside with poetry as with a veil and the poor buildings lose themselves in the dim sky and the tall chimneys become campanili and the warehouses are palaces in the night and the whole city hangs in the heavens and fairyland is before us End quote. that is as perfect in its dim and delicate beauty as any of his painted nocturnes but his aim was more often to pour ridicule and contempt and herein the weirdness of his natural vocabulary and the patchiness of his reading were of very real value to him take the opening words of his letter to tom taylor Quote, dead for a ducat dead my dear tom and the rattle has reached me by post sans racune say you bah you scream unkind threats and die badly End quote. and another letter to the same unfortunate man quote, why my dear old tom i never was serious with you even when you were among us indeed i killed you quite as who should say with seriousness a rat a rat you know rather cursorily End quote. there the very lack of coherence in the style as of a man grasping and choking with laughter drives the insults home with a horrible precision notice the technical skill in the placing of you know rather cursorily at the end of the sentence whistler was full of such tricks tricks that could never have been played by him could never have occurred to him had he acquired the professional touch and not a letter in the book but has some such little sharp felicity of cadence or construction the letters of course are the best thing in the book and the best of the letters are the briefest an exquisite talent like whistler's whether in painting or in writing is always at its best on a small scale on a large scale it strays and is distressed thus the ten o'clock from which i took that passage about the evening mist and the riverside does not leave me with a sense of artistic satisfaction it lacks structure it is not a roundly conceived whole it is but a row of fragments were it otherwise whistler could never have written so perfectly the little letters for no man who can finally grasp a big theme can play exquisitely round a little one nor can any man who excels in scoffing at his fellows excel also in taking abstract subjects seriously certainly the little letters are whistler's passport among the elect of literature luckily i can judge them without prejudice whether in this or that case whistler was in the right or in the wrong is not a question which troubles me at all i read the letters simply from the literary standpoint as controversial essays certainly they were often in very bad taste an urchin scribbling insults upon somebody's garden wall would not go further than whistler often went whistler's mode of controversy reminds me in another sense of the writing on the wall they who were so foolish as to oppose him really did have their souls required of them 
after an encounter with him they never again were quite the same men in the eyes of their fellows whistler's insults always stuck stuck and spread round the insulted who found themselves at length encased in them like flies in amber you may shed a tear over the flies if you will for myself i am content to laud the amber end of section ten section eleven of yet again by max beerbohm this librivox recording is in the public domain ichabod it is not cast from any obvious mould of sentiment it is not a memorial urn nor a ruined tower nor any of those things which he who runs may weep over though not less really deplorable than they it needs i am well aware some sort of explanation to enable my reader to mourn with me for it is merely a hat-box it is nothing but that an ordinary affair of pigskin with a brass lock as i write it stands on a table near me it is of the kind that accommodates two hats one above the other it has had many tenants and is sun-tanned rain-soiled scarred and dented by collision with trucks and what not other accessories to the moving scenes through which it has been bandied yes it has known the stress of many journeys yet it has never you would say seeing it received its baptism of paste it has not one label on it and there indeed is the tragedy that i shall unfold for many years this hat-box had been my travelling companion and was but a few days since a dear record of all the big and little journeys i had made it was much more to me than a mere receptacle for hats it was my one collection my collection of labels well last week its lock was broken i sent it to the trunk makers telling them to take the greatest care of it it came back yesterday the idiots the accursed idiots had carefully removed every label from its surface i wrote to them it matters not what i said my fury has burnt itself out i have reached the stage of craving general sympathy so i have sat down to write in the shadow of a tower which stands bleak bare prosaic all the ivy of its years stripped from it in the shadow of an urn commemorating nothing i think that every one who is or ever has been a collector will pity me in this dark hour of mine in other words, I think that nearly every one will pity me, for few are they who have not, at some time, come under the spell of the collecting spirit, and known the joy of accumulating specimens of something or other. The instinct has its corner, surely, in every breast. Of course, hobby horses are of many different breeds, but all their riders belong to one great cavalcade and when they know that one of their company has had his steed shot under him they will not ride on without a backward glance of sympathy lest my fall be unnoted by them i write this essay i want that glance do not reader suspect that because i am choosing my words nicely and playing with metaphor and putting my commas in their proper places my sorrow is not really and truly poignant i write elaborately for that is my habit and habits are less easily broken than hearts i could no more dash off this my cri de coeur than i could an elegy on a broomstick i had never seen therefore reader bear with me despite my sable plumes and purple 
and weep with me, though my prose be, like those verses which Mr. Beamish wrote over Chloe's grave, of a character to cool emotion. For, indeed, my anguish is very real. The collection I had amassed so carefully during so many years, the collection I loved and reveled in, has been obliterated, swept away, destroyed utterly by a pair of ruthless, impious, well-meaning, idiotic, unseen hands. It cannot be restored to me. Nothing can compensate me, for it was part and parcel of my life. Orchids, jade, majolica, wines, mezzotints, old silver, first editions, harps, copes, hookahs, cameos, enamels, black-letter folios, scarabae, such things are beautiful and fascinating in themselves. Railway labels are not, I admit. For the most part they are crudely colored, crudely printed, without sense of margin or spacing, in fact quite worthless as designs. No one would be a connoisseur in them. No one could be tempted to make a general collection of them. My own collection of them was strictly personal. I wanted none that was not a symbol of some journey made by myself, even as the hunter of big game cares not to possess the tusks, and the hunter of women covets not the photographs of other people's victims. My collection was one of those which results from man's tendency to preserve some obvious record of his pleasures, the points he has scored in the game. To Nimrod his tusks, to Lothario his photographs, to me, who cut no dash in either of those veneries, and am not greedy enough to preserve menus, nor silly enough to preserve press cuttings, but do delight in travelling from place to place, my railway labels. Had nomadi been my business, had I been a commercial traveller or a king's messenger, such labels would have held for me no charming significance. But I am only by instinct a nomad. I have a tether, known as the four-mile radius. To slip it is for me always an event, an excitement. To come to a new place, to awaken in a strange bed, to be among strangers, to have dispelled, as by sudden magic, the old environment, it is on the scoring of such points as these that I preen myself, and my memory is always ringing the changes I have had, complacently, as a man jingles silver in his pocket. The noise of a great terminus is no jar to me. It is music. I prick up my ears to it and paw the platform. Dear to me as the bugle note to any war-horse, as the first twittering of the birds in the hedgerows to the light-sleeping vagabond, that cry of, Take your seats, please, or, better still, En voiture, or Partenza. Had I the knack of rhyme, I would write a sonnet sequence of the journey to Newhaven or Dover, a sonnet for every station one does not stop at. I await that poet who shall worthily celebrate the Iron Road. There is one who describes, with accuracy and gusto, the inside of engines, but he will not do at all. I look for another, who shall show us the heart of the passenger, the exhilaration of travelling by day, the exhilaration and romance and self-importance of travelling by night. Paris! How it thrills me when, on a night in spring, in the hustle and glare of Victoria, that label is slapped upon my hat-box. Here, standing in the very heart of London, I am by one sweep of a paste-brush transported instantly into that white-gray city across the sea. To all intents and purposes, I am in Paris already. Strange that the porter does not say, Voilà, monsieur. Strange that the evening papers I buy at the bookstall are printed in the English language. 
strange that london still holds my body when a corduroyed magician has whisked my soul verily into paris the engine is hissing as i hurry my body along the platform eager to reunite it with my soul over the windy quay the stars are shining as i pass down the gangway hat-box in hand they twinkle brightly over the deck i am now pacing amused maybe at my excitement the machinery grunts and creaks the little boat quakes in the excruciating throes of its departure at last one by one the stars take their last look at me and the sky grows pale and the sea blanches mysteriously with it through the delicate cold air of the dawn across the grey waves of the sea the outlines of dieppe grow and grow the quay is lined with its blue bloused throng these porters are as excited by us as though they were the aborigines of some unknown island and yet are they not here at this hour in these circumstances every day of their lives these gestures these voices hoarse with passion the dear music of french rippling up clear for me through all this hoarse confusion of its utterance and making me happy i drink my cup of steaming coffee true coffee and devour more than one roll at the tables around me pale and dishevelled from the night sit the people whom i saw years ago at charing cross how they have changed the coffee sends a glow throughout my body i am fulfilled with a sense of material well-being the queer ethereal exaltation of the dawn has vanished i climb up into the train and dispose myself in the dun cushioned coupe chemin de fer de l'ouest is perforated on the white antimacassars familiar and strange inscription i murmur its impressive iams over and over again they become the refrain to which the train vibrates on its way i smoke cigarettes a little drowsily gazing out of the window at the undulating french scenery that flies past me at the silver poplars row after slanted row of these incomparably gracious trees flies past me their foliage shimmering in the unawoken landscape soon i shall be rattling over the cobbles of unawoken paris through the wide white-gray streets with their unopened jalousie and when later i awake in the unnatural little bedroom of a walnut wood and crimson velvet in the bed whose curtains are white with that whiteness which paris alone can give to linen a parisian sun will be glittering for me in a parisian sky yes in my whole collection the paris specimens were dearest to me meant most to me i think but there was none that had not some tendrils on sentiment all of them i prized more or less of the aberdeen specimens i was immensely fond who can resist the thought of that express by which night after night england is torn up its centre i love well that cab drive in the chill autumnal night through the desert of bloomsbury the dead leaves rustling round the horses hoofs as we gallop through the squares ah i shall be across the border before these doorsteps are cleaned before the coming of the milk carts anon i descry the cavernous open jaws of euston the monster swallows me and soon i am being digested into scotland i sit ensconced in a corner of a compartment the collar of my ulster is above my ears my cap is pulled over my eyes my feet are on a hot water tin and my rug snugly envelops most of me sleeping cars are for the strange beings who love not the act of travelling them i should spurn even if i could not sleep a wink in an ordinary compartment i would liefer forfeit sleep than the consciousness of travelling but it happens that i in an ordinary compartment am blessed both with the sleep and with the consciousness all through the long night 
To be asleep, and to know that you are sleeping, and to know, too, that even as you sleep you are being borne away through darkness into distance, that, surely, is to go too better than endymion. Surely nothing is more mysteriously delightful than this joint consciousness of sleep and movement. Pitiable they to whom it is denied. All through the night the vibration of the train keeps one-third of me awake, while the other two parts of me profoundly slumber. Whenever the train stops and the vibration ceases, then the one-third of me falls asleep and the other two parts stir. I am awake just enough to hear the hollow echoing cry of Crew or York and to blink up at the green hooded lamp in the ceiling. Maybe I raise a corner of the blind and see through the steam dim window the mysterious empty station. A solitary porter shuffles along the platform. Yonder, those are the lights of the refreshment room where all night long a barmaid is keeping her lonely vigil over the beer handles and the bath buns in glass cases i see long rows of glimmering milk cans and wonder drowsily whether they contain forty modern thieves the engine snorts angrily in the benighted silence far away is the faint familiar sound clink clank clink clank of the man who tests the couplings nearer and nearer the sound comes it passes recedes it is rather melancholy a whistle a jerk and the two waking parts of me are asleep again while the third wakes up to mount guard over them and keeps me deliciously aware of the rhythmic dream they are dreaming about the hot bath and the clean linen and the lovely breakfast that i am to have at aberdeen and of the scotch air crisp and clean that is to escort me later along the dee side little journeys as along the dee side have a charm of their own little journeys from london to places up the river or to places on the coast of kent journeys so brief that you lunch at one end and have tea at the other i love them all and loved the labels that recalled them to me but the labels of long journeys of course took precedence in my heart here and there on my hat-box were labels that recalled to me long journeys in which frontiers were crossed at dead of night dim memories of small crazy stations where i shivered half awake and was sleepily conscious of a strange tongue and strange uniforms of my jingling bunch of keys of ruthless arms diving into the nethermost recesses of my trunks of suspicious grunts and glances and of grudging hieroglyphics chalked on the slammed lids these were things more or less painful and resented in the moment of experience yet even then fraught with a delicious glamour i suffered but gladly in the night when all things are mysteriously magnified i have never crossed a frontier without feeling some of the pride of conquest and indeed were these conquests mere illusions was i not actually extending the frontiers of my mind adding new territories to it every crossed frontier every crossed sea meant for me a definite success an expansion and enrichment of my soul when after seven days and nights of sea traversed i caught my first glimpse of sandy hook was there no comparison between columbus and myself to see what one has not seen before is not that almost as good as to see what no one has ever seen romance exhilaration self-importance these are what my labels symbolized and recalled to me that lost collection was a running record of all my happiest hours a focus a moment a diary it was my humble odyssey wrought in coloured paper on pigskin and the one work i never never was weary of 
if the distinguished Ithacan had travelled with a hat-box, how finely and minutely Homer would have described it, its depth and girth, its cunningly fashioned lock and fair lining withal, and in how interminable a torrent of hexameters would he have catalogued all the labels on it, including those attractive views of the Hotel Circe, the Hotel Calypso, and other high-class resorts. Yet, no, had such a hat-box existed, and had it been preserved in his day, Homer would have seen in it a sufficient record, a better record than even he could make of Odysseus's wanderings. We should have had nothing from him but the Iliad, I certainly never felt any need of commemorating my journeys till my labels were lost to me. And I am conscious how poor and chill is the substitute. My collection, like most collections, began imperceptibly. A man does not say to himself, I am going to collect this thing or that. True, the schoolboy says so but his are not in the true sense of the word collections he seeks no set autobiographic symbols for boys never look back there is too little to look back on too much in front nor have the objects of his collection any intrinsic charm for him he starts a collection merely that he may have a plausible excuse for doing something he ought not to do he goes in for birds' eggs merely that he may be allowed to risk his bones and tear his clothes in climbing, for butterflies that he may be encouraged to poison and impale, for stamps. Really, I do not know why he, why any sane creature, goes in for stamps. It follows that he has no real love of his collection and soon abandons it for something else the sincere collector how different his hobby has a solid basis of personal preference some one gives him say a piece of jade he admires it he sees another piece in a shop and buys it later he buys another he does not regard these pieces of jade as distinct from the rest of his possessions he has no idea of collecting jade it is not till he has acquired several other pieces that he ceases to regard them as mere items in the decoration of his room, and gives them a little table, or a tray of a cabinet, all to themselves. How well they look there! How they intensify one another! He really must get someone to give him that little pedestal stupid which he saw yesterday in Mordor Street. Thus awakes in him, quite gradually, the spirit of the collector or take the case of one whose collection is not of beautiful things but of autobiographic symbols take the case of the glutton he will have pocketed many menus before it occurs to him to arrange them in an album even so it was not until a fair number of labels had been pasted on my hat-box that i saw them as souvenirs and determined that in future my hat-box should always travel with me and so commemorate my every darling escape in the path of every collector are strewn obstacles of one kind or another which to overleap is part of the fun as a collector of labels i had my pleasant difficulties on any much belabeled piece of baggage the porter always pastes a new label over that which looks most recent else the thing might miss its destination now paste dries before the end of the briefest journey and one of my canons was that though two labels might overlap none must efface the inscription of another on the other hand i did not wish to lose my hat-box for this would have entailed inquiries and descriptions and telegraphing up the line and all manner of agitation what then was i to do i might have taken my hat-box with me in the carriage that indeed is what i always did but unless a thing is to go in the van it receives no label at all so i had to use a mild stratagem 
Yes, I would say, everything in the van. The labels would be duly affixed. Oh, I would cry, seizing the hat-box quickly. I forgot. I want this with me in the carriage. I learned to seize it quickly, because some porters are such martinets that they will whisk the label off and confiscate it. Then, when the man was not looking, I would remove the label from the place he had chosen for it, and press it on some unoccupied part of the surface. You cannot think how much I enjoyed these manoeuvres. There was the moral pleasure of having both outwitted a railway company and secured another specimen for my collection, and there was the physical pleasure of making a limp slip of paper stick to a hard substance, that simple pleasure which appeals to all of us and is perhaps the missing explanation of philately. Pressed for time, I could not, of course, have played my trick, nor could I have done so, it would have seemed heartless, if any one had come to see me off and be agitated at parting. Therefore, I was always very careful to arrive in good time for my train, and to insist that all farewells should be made on my own doorstep. Only in one case did I break the rule that no label must be obliterated by another. It is a long story, but I propose to tell it. You must know that I loved my labels not only for the meanings they conveyed to me, but also, more than a little, for the effect they produced on other people. Travelling in a compartment, with my hat-box beside me, I enjoyed the silent interest which my labels aroused in my fellow passengers. If the compartment was so full that my hat-box had to be relegated to the rack, I would always, in the course of the journey, take it down and unlock it, and pretend to be looking for something I had put into it. It pleased me to see from beneath my eyelids the respectful wonder and envy evoked by it. Of course, there was no suspicion that the labels were a carefully formed collection. They were taken as the wild flowers of an exquisite restlessness, of an unrestricted range in life. Many of them signified beautiful or famous places. There was one point at which Oxford, Newmarket, and Assisi converged, and I was always careful to shift my hat-box round in such a way that this purple patch should be lost on none of my fellow passengers. The many other labels, English or alien, they too gave their hints of a life spent in fastidious freedom, hints that I had seen and was seeing all that is best to be seen of men and cities and country houses, I was respected accordingly, and envied. And I had keen delight in this ill-gotten homage. A despicable delight, you say? But is not yours too a fallen nature? The love of impressing strangers falsely, is it not implanted in all of us? To be sure, it is an inevitable outcome of the conditions in which we exist. It is a result of the struggle for life. Happiness, as you know, is our aim in life. We are all struggling to be happy, and, alas, for every one of us, it is the things he does not possess which seem to him most desirable, most conducive to happiness. For instance, the poor nobleman covets wealth because wealth would bring him comfort, whereas the nouveau riche covets a pedigree because a pedigree would make of him what he is merely in. The rich nobleman who is an invalid covets health on the assumption that health would enable him to enjoy his wealth and position. The rich robust nobleman hankers after an intellect, the rich, robust, intellectual nobleman is, be sure of it, as discontented, somehow, as the rest of them. No man possesses all he wants. No man is ever quite happy. But by producing an impression that he has what he wants, 
In fact, by bluffing, a man can gain some of the advantages that he would gain by really having it. Thus, the poor nobleman can, by concealing his balance and keeping up appearances, coax more or less unlimited credit from his tradesmen. The nouveau riche, by concealing his origin and trafficking with the College of Heralds, can intercept some of the homage paid to high birth. And, though the rich nobleman who is an invalid can make no tangible gain by pretending to be robust, since robustness is an advantage only from within, the rich, robust nobleman can, by employing a clever private secretary to write public speeches and magazine articles for him, intercept some of the homage which is paid to intellect. These are but a few typical cases, taken at random from a small area. But consider the human race at large, and you will find that bluffing is indeed one of the natural functions of the human animal. Every man pretends to have what, not having it, he covets in order that he may gain some of the advantages of having it. And thus it comes that he makes his pretense, also by force of habit, when there is nothing tangible to be gained by it. The poor nobleman wishes to be thought rich even by people who will not benefit him in their delusion, and the nouveau riche likes to be thought well-born even by people who set no store on good birth, and so forth. But pretenses, whether they be an end or a means, cannot be made successfully among our intimate friends. These wretches know all about us, having seen through us long ago. With them we are, accordingly, quite natural. That is why we find their company so restful. Among acquaintances, the pretense is worth making. But those who know anything at all about us are apt to find us out. That is why we find acquaintances such a nuisance. Among perfect strangers, who know nothing at all about us, we start with a clean slate. If our pretense does not come off, we have only ourselves to blame. And so we bluff these strangers blithely for all we are worth, whether there be anything to gain or nothing. We all do it. Let us despise ourselves for doing it, but not one another. By which I mean, reader, do not be hard on me for making a show of my labels in railway carriages. After all, the question is whether a man bluff well or ill. If he brag vulgarly before his strangers, away with him, by all means. He does not know how to play the game. He is a failure. But if he convey subtly, and therefore successfully, the fine impression he wishes to convey, then you should stifle your wrath and try to pick up a few hints. When I saw my fellow passengers eyeing my hat-box, I did not, of course, say aloud to them, Yes, mine is a delightful life, any amount of money, any amount of leisure, and what's more, I know how to make the best use of them both. Had I done so, they would have immediately seen through me as an impostor. But I did nothing of the sort. I let my labels proclaim distinction for me quietly, in their own way. And they made their proclamation with immense success. But there came among them, in course of time, one label that would not harmonize with them. Came at length one label that did me actual discredit. I happened to have had influenza, and my doctor had ordered me to make my convalescence in a place which, according to him, was better than any other for my particular condition. He had ordered me to Ramsgate, and to Ramsgate I had gone. A label on my hat-box duly testified to my obedience. At the time I had thought nothing of it. But in subsequent journeys I noticed that my hat-box did not make its old effect somehow. My fellow-passengers looked at it, 
were interested in it, but I had a subtle sense that they were not reverencing me as of yore. Something was the matter. I was not long in tracing what it was. The discord struck by Ramsgate was the more disastrous because, in my heedlessness, I had placed that ignoble label within an inch of my point d'appui, the trinity of Oxford, Newmarket, and Assisi. What was I to do? I could not explain to my fellow passengers, as I have explained to you, my reason for Ramsgate. So long as the label was there, I had to rest under the hideous suspicion of having gone there for pleasure, gone of my own free will. I did rest under it during the next two or three journeys, but the injustice of my position maddened me. At length, a too obvious sneer on the face of a fellow passenger steeled me to a resolve that I would, for once, break my rule against obliteration. On the return journey, I obliterated Ramsgate with the new label, leaving visible merely the final T.E., which could hardly compromise me. Steterunt those two letters, because I was loath to destroy what was, primarily, a symbol for myself. I wished to remember Ramsgate, even though I had to keep it secret. Only, in a secondary, accidental way, was my collection meant for the public eye. Else I should not have hesitated to deck the hat-box with procured symbols, of Seville, Simla, St. Petersburg, and other places which I had not, and would have liked to be supposed to have, visited. But my collection was, first of all, a private autobiography, a record of my scores of fate, and thus, positively to falsify it, would have been for me as impossible as cheating at patience. From that to which I would not add, I hated to subtract anything, even Ramsgate. After all, Ramsgate was not London. To have been in it was a kind of score. Besides, it had restored me to health. I had no right to raise it utterly. But such tendresse was not my sole reason for sparing those two letters. Already I was reaching the stage where the collector loves his specimens not for their single sakes, but as units in the sum total. To every collector comes, at last, a time when he does but value his collection, how shall I say, collectively. He who goes in for beautiful things begins, at last, to value his every acquisition, not for its beauty, but because it enhances the worth of the rest. Likewise, he who goes in for autobiographic symbols begins, at last, to care not for the symbolism of another event in his life, but for the addition to the objects already there. He begins to value every event less for its own sake than because it swells his collection. Thus there came for me a time when I looked forward to a journey less because it meant movement and change for myself, than because it meant another label for my hat-box. A strange state to fall into? Yes, collecting is a mania, a form of madness, and it is the most pleasant form of madness in the whole world. It can bring us nearer to real happiness than can any form of sanity. The normal, eclectic man is never happy because he is always craving something of another kind than what he has got. The collector, in his mad concentration, wants only more and more of what he has got already, and what he has got already he cherishes with a passionate joy. I cherished my gallimaufry of rainbow-colored labels, almost as passionately as the miser his hoard of gold. Why do we call the collector of current coin a miser? Wretched, he? True, he denies himself all the reputed pleasures of life, but does he not do so of his own accord, gladly? 
he sacrifices everything to his mania but that merely proves how intense his mania is in that the nature of his collection cuts him off from all else he is the perfect type of collector he is above all other collectors and he is the truly happiest of them all it is only when by some merciless stroke of fate he is robbed of his hoard that he becomes wretched then certainly he suffers he suffers proportionately to his joy he is smitten with sorrow more awful than any sorrow to be conceived by the same i whose rainbow-coloured hoard has been swept from me seem to taste the full savour of his anguish i sit here thinking of the misers who in life or in fiction have been despoiled three only do i remember melanippus of sicyon pierre baudouin of limoux silas marner melanippus died of a broken heart pierre baudouin hanged himself the case of silas marner is more cheerful he coming into his cottage one night saw by the dim light of the hearth that which seemed to be his gold restored but was really nothing but the golden curls of a little child whom he was destined to rear under his own roof finding in her more than solace for his bereavement but then he was a character in fiction the other two really existed what happened to him will not happen to me even if the little children with rainbow-coloured hair were so common that one of them might possibly be left on my hearth-rug i know well that i should not feel recompensed by it even if it grew up to be as fascinating a paragon as eppy herself had silas marner really existed nay even had george eliot created him in her maturity neither would have felt recompensed far likelier he would have been turned to stone in the first instance as was poor niobe when the divine arrows destroyed that unique collection on which she had lavished so many years or maybe had he been a very strong man he would have found a bitter joy in saving up for a new hoard like carlyle when the manuscript of his masterpiece was burned by the housemaid of john stuart mill he might have begun all over again and builded a still nobler monument on the tragic ashes that is a fine heartening example i will be strong enough to follow it i will forget all else i will begin all over again there stands my hat-box its glory is departed but i vow that a greater glory awaits it bleak bare and prosaic it is now but ten years hence its career like that of the imperial statesman in the moment of his downfall is only just beginning there is a true anglo-saxon ring in this conclusion may it appease whomever my tears have been making angry End of section 11。section 12 of yet again by max beerbohm。this librivox recording is in the public domain。general elections。i admire detachment。i commend a serene indifference to hubbub。I like Archimedes, Leonardo da Vinci, Goethe, Balzac, Darwin, and other sages for having been so concentrated on this or that eternal verity in art or science or philosophy that they paid no heed to alarums and excursions which were sweeping all other folk off their feet it is with some shame that i haunt the tape machine whenever a general election is going on of politics i know nothing 
my mind is quite open on the subject of fiscal reform and quite empty and the void is not an aching one i have no desire to fill it the idea of the british empire leaves me quite cold if this or that subject race threw off our yoke i should feel less vexation than if one comma were misplaced in the printing of this essay the only feeling that our colonies inspire in me is a determination not to visit them socialism neither affrights nor attracts me or rather it has both these effects equally when i think of poverty and misery crushing the greater part of humanity and most of all when i hear of some specific case of distress i become a socialist indeed and when i think of demos that chin-bearded god flushed with victory crowned with leaflets of the social democratic league quaffing temperance beverages in a world all drab when i think of model lodging-houses in st james's park and trams running round and round st james's square the mighty fallen and the lowly swollen and in elysium the shade of matthew arnold shedding tears on the shoulder of a shade so different as george brummel's tears idle tears at sight of the barbarians whom he had mocked and loved now annihilated by those others whom he had mocked and hated when such previsions as these come surging up in me i do deem myself well content with the present state of things dishonourable though it is as to socialism then you see my mind is evenly divided it is with no political bias that i go and hover around the tape machine my interest in general elections is a merely sporting interest i do not mean that i lay bets a bad fairy decreed over my cradle that i should lose every bet that i might make and in course of time i abandoned a practice which took away from coming events the pleasing element of uncertainty a merely dramatic interest is less equivocal and more accurate this you say is rank incivism i assume readily that you are an ardent believer in one political party or another and that having studied thoroughly all the questions at issue you could give cogent reasons for all the burning faith that is in you but how about your friends and acquaintances how many of them can cope with you in discussion how many of them show even a desire to cope with you travel i beg you on the underground railway or in a tube such places are supposed to engender in their passengers a taste for political controversy yet how very elementary are such arguments as you will hear there it is obvious that these gentlemen know and care very little about burning questions what they do know and care about is the purely personal side of politics they have their likes and their dislikes for a few picturesque and outstanding figures these they will attack or defend with fervour but you will be lucky if you overhear any serious discussion of policy emerge from the netherworld range over the whole community from the costermonger who says good old winston to the fashionable woman who says i do think mr balfour is rather wonderful and you will find the same plentiful lack of interest in the impersonal side of polities you will find that almost every one is interested in politics only as a personal conflict between certain interesting men as a drama in fact frown not then on me alone whenever a general election occurs the conflict becomes sharper and more obvious the play more exciting the audience more tense the stage is crowded with supernumeraries not interesting in themselves 
but adding a new interest to the merely personal interest. There is the stronger side, here the weaker, ranged against each other, which will be vanquished. It rests with the audience to decide, and, as human nature is human nature, of course the audience decides that the weaker side shall be victorious. That is what politicians call the swing of the pendulum. They believe that the country is alienated by the blunders of the government and is disappointed by the unfulfillment of promises and is anxious for other methods of policy. Bless them! The country hardly noticed their blunders, has quite forgotten their promises, and cannot distinguish between one set of methods and another. When the man in the street sees two other men in the street fighting, he doesn't care to know the cause of the combat. He simply wants the smaller man to punish the bigger, and to punish him with all possible severity. When a party with a large majority appeals to the country, its appeal falls, necessarily, on deaf ears. Some years ago there happened an exception to this rule, but then the circumstances were exceptional. A small nation was fighting a big nation, and, as the big nation happened to be yourselves, your sympathy was transferred to the big nation. As the little party was suspected of favouring the little nation, your sympathy was transferred likewise to the big party. Barring cocky, sympathy takes its usual course in general elections the bigger the initial majority the bigger the collapse it is not enough that goliath shall fall he must bite the dust and bite plenty of it it is not enough that david shall have done what he set out to do a throne must be found for this young man away with the giant's body hail king david I should like to think that chivalry was the sole motive of our zeal. I am afraid that the mere craving for excitement has something to do with it. Pelion has never piled on Osa, and no really useful purpose could be served by the superimposition. But we should like to see the thing done. It would appeal to our sense of the grandiose, our hankering after the unlimited, when the man of science shows us a drop of water in a test tube and tells us that this tiny drop contains more than fifteen billions of infusoria, we are subtly gratified and cherish a secret hope that the number of infusoria is very much more than fifteen billions. In the same way, we hope that the number of seats gained by the winning party will be even greater tomorrow than it is today. We are sweeping the country, exclaims, say, the professed liberal, and at the word sweeping, there is in his eyes a gleam that no mere party feeling could have lit there. It is a gleam that comes from the very depths of his soul, a reflection of the innate human passion for breaking records, or seeing them broken, no matter how or why. Yes says the professed Tory, you certainly are sweeping the country. He tries to put a note of despondency into his voice, but hark how he rolls the word sweeping over his tongue. He too, though he may not admit it, is longing to creep into the smoking room of the National Liberal Club and feast his eyes on the blazing galaxy of red seals affixed to the announcements of the polling. He turns to his evening paper, and reads again the list of ex-cabinet ministers who have been unseated. He feels, in his heart of hearts, what fun it would be if they had all been unseated. He grudges the exceptions. For political bias is one thing, human nature another. End of section 12